Hi beauties, welcome back to day three of Hollow Week. I hope you guys are all well today. I am very excited about today's video actually. Um, we, are, we are officially moving into the wig phase of the costumes. The first two were just my normal hair and now I'm getting intricate with everything. So today the, the look is actually a dark angel look. Um, I do have my devil horns on. Um, I can't wait for you guys to see the full outfit when we're done with makeup because I found these. I hope you guys can see them on camera. They're very large. I don't know exactly how I'm gonna put them on because they are, um, they're old. They're like 10, 12 years old at this point because they were from my sophomore year of high school when I was in my scene weenie phase and I wanted to be a, the angel of death for Halloween. I was, it was successful, but they have lost a lot of ela elasticity in the, the rope that holds them to my body. So we're gonna see how I can jigger it to make it work to get some good pictures so yes but i am um i'm really excited for today's look and as you guys know with the stories that i've been choosing to research and tell you guys as i'm doing my makeup i'm trying to make them relate to the costume so i was really trying to think like what can i do for this because like that's not really something that like there's not really a history of like dark angels like I mean, there is, but like, do I want to get into like biblical humor or anything or humor, biblical stories or anything like that? And I was like, no, I don't. So what I decided instead was I would talk about a subject that is close to my heart, which as you guys know, is the witch trials. Everybody really liked the witch trials last time I talked about them. So I figured this would be a good time to, uh, to tell a different facet, a different area of focus. And this is actually an area that is fascinating. There's so much information out there on it. This is the Scotland witch trials, which really started kind of in the 1590s. I mean, it was kind of, there and before, a little bit before that, but it really took, just took off in, in 1590 and then um, lasted all the way into the 1700s and was just absolutely brutal. Thousands of witches lost their lives. So we're gonna talk about that today. I'm going to do some dark makeup. I'm going to push the beautiful wig back so I don't get makeup in it, hopefully. Just as a basis, we are going to say, uh, I did like a really light foundation. I actually mixed it with a white pigment to make it even lighter. And I did my eyebrows, but everything else, the contour and everything, is going to be dark. Eyeshadow, I'm not gonna really talk about those, but I, I have the Huda Beauty little red uh, Ruby Obsessions eyeshadow palette. And then I also have this Drop Dead Gorgeous Little Bit Psycho palette from, uh, from BH. I intended to do reviews of this and the big one. Um, the I think the other one's called like Full On Crazy or something like that. Uh, these were an absolute nightmare. I bought both of them from Ulta and just the two of them alone. They both showed up broken. They resent them to me. And then this one was intact. And then the big one was once again broken. So Nikki returned it in store for me and then came home and dropped it. And it also broke. So uh, I'm done with that palette. We're, we're not meant to be three times broken and it's we're done. So this one we'll use today. And then I also have Drop Dead Gorgeous Glitter Blood from that collection as well from the BH uh, Halloween collection. And we are going to make a dark angel look with it. Now that we've talked about all that stuff, away we go into the story. So like I said, 1590 is really when we see um, everything kind of tart, start to take place. And really the person who can be credited with um, launching, I'm going to credit him with launching not only the Scotland witch trials, but the England witch trials as well, uh, which start to happen in the 1600s, uh, is King James VI of Scotland. And he, in 1603, becomes King James I of England. So that's how he winds up bringing this, um, this really cruel obsession with him when he goes on to, um, to become the king of, of another country. So we'll talk about just briefly the European witch trials really one of the first times we see it start to take shape, start to become part of the public knowledge is when Malleus Maleficarum is released in uh, 1487. And that is a book that was uh, written and published by Heinrich Kramer and uh, Jacob Springer. It, it outlined how to identify witches, what to do with witches, how we can prove that they're true. And it's pretty horrific. Um, and it, it, did de it definitely sparked some, uh, some craze, some witch hunt fascination in Germany and then spread to the other European countries. There was a little bit of kind of a knowledge of like, we need to be aware of this uh, because witches are out there and they're coming for you. There was definitely that kind of a knowledge in Scotland, but 
when we see it take shape is not until 1589. King James VI takes a bride, Queen Anne of Denmark, and they marry remotely. So basically they are in their respective countries. They come to the business arrangement that was marriage back then, especially for royalty. It is decided that Queen Anne will take a journey to her new home in Scotland to be with her new husband, who she has never met in person. When that happens, she sets sail in October of that year. No, I'm sorry, September. September of that year. She set sail and of course, <laughs> September is probably not the best time to sail because there's always, with the changing of weather and the pressure changes, there's always storms. So her ship experiences a really horrible storm and they're forced to port in Norway. They port for a little while. Of course, the king who is waiting for his new bride in Scotland is very impatient because um, once you're married, we all know that means you get to consummate the marriage. So he was not ready to wait. He's kind of like, you know, I'm not pushing her, but he's just like, you know, get there, but I want you here. So they set sail again. They leave Norway and they start heading towards Scotland and now on their second voyage their boat springs a leak and so they turn back around and go back to Norway and so he being impatient he being King James VI being impatient decides I'm going to go I'm going to um, to fetch my bride I'm gonna bring her back to Scotland myself because um, this seems to be not working out very well so he heads off to Norway and he meets her in Norway and he decides to spend a few months with her in Norway and in Denmark so he can kind of get to know you know her her past her lifestyle all that good stuff they spend the pretty much the remainder of 1589 in Denmark and in Norway. And then while they're in Norway, James discovers the danger of witches. It's because in Norway, they were more on board with the whole, we need to stop the witches at this point than Scotland was. Scotland did have, don't, don't get me wrong, like I said, it was there. It wasn't super prevalent, but it was there. In fact, uh, King James's mother, who was Mary Queen of Scots, in 1563, Mary Queen of Scots had made witchcraft witchcraft a capital offense and um it was an act called the scottish witchcraft act this made it legal to accuse torture and execute people simply on the charges of witchcraft so it was definitely there in scotland it just wasn't a, a primary focus until after this so yeah so that so it's there but it's not like i said it's not a focus so in 1590 in Denmark, officials accuse a, a few witches of attempting to kill the king and the queen um, by cursing the sea and basically condemning their voyage and uh, making it so that they, they had no ability to pass through such treacherous waters. Of course, we know, knowing weather systems and that that is just a bad time to try and make that kind of a large voyage anywhere really, um, because there is just a more natural inclination for storms to um, to be created. Of course, you know, here in, you know, in the Atlantic, we see hurricanes and things like that. So it's, it, it wasn't, <laughs> Was it witchcraft? I mean, I guess it could be, but like, no. But that's what they wanted to blame it on. They wanted to have something that they could point a finger to and say, this is the reason why. So of course, and this is where the issue with witch, witch accusations come in. You were never gonna get out of it alive. I've studied a lot about it and I, there's not a lot of cases where people left unscathed. Um, even if they did somehow manage to avoid being executed, they were forever thought of and seen as this blight on on humanity and the, the city and the town that they were in. And so it was, your life was over when you were accused. So a lot of times, especially after having gone through so much torture and everything, they would confess um, just to get the, just to, just to be done with it. Cause they knew they weren't gonna have a life. So they would confess in hopes that um, they would just be executed. It's horrible. It's, it's really, it's, and to think about it, it took place um, in so many different areas of the world. It's really, truly heartbreaking, which is I think why it's so fascinating to me in like the worst way possible. It's fascinating. And like, how can humans be that cruel? Um, and also like, let's, let's remember the people who were taken because of this. So that's just a little, oh, I forgot to say at the beginning of the video, but there is some graphic stuff that I will describe, um, different ways that they're tortured. So if you guys are sensitive to that kind of stuff, it, it pains me to talk about and to think about. So if you guys are sensitive to that, be very, very warned, um, that, you know, this may be triggering. So just be aware of that. I did want to put that in there. I forgot to at the beginning because I was excited. So these, these witches are accused in Denmark and of course they are ultimately found guilty and they are executed for it. Well, this, this moment is really defining for um, King James because he is kind of like, oh my gosh, so this is like, 
a thing. Like they wanted to curse, they wanted to take us out and, and do we need to be worried about this? And so he's thinking, well, if the devil was able to convince these women in Denmark that we needed to be stopped, then what happens? The devil's, you know, he can talk to whoever he wants to and, and, and say the whole thing all around the world. So why wouldn't he be coming to people in Scotland and trying to get witches to do the same thing in Scotland as well? So when they make it back home and their last journey back home, cause it's still winter time. So it's still not a great time to sail. Um, their last journey back home is not much better. It is very riddled with storms. It is very, very treacherous. They almost don't make it, but they do. They ultimately do get back um, safely to Scotland. And early as soon as they're there, James makes it a, makes people aware that we need to be on the hunt for witches. Like we need to be actively seeking them out because I think this is a problem. King James had a bailiff who uh, was a, a friend of his who he, he knew regularly. And I, I say friend, I, he's referred to as a friend. It's one of those situations where like, is he really a friend of the king or like, is he just kind of a higher up and he knows the king? I don't really know at this point, like when we start out, if he is a friend friend or if he's just like an acquaintance or somebody who has enough power or clout within the community to know the king firsthand. Cause it, it's one of those kind of like, they're always like, he was a friend of the king. And I was like, did the king have friends? Like, I don't know, whatever. But yeah, so this man, David Seaton was a bailiff. Basically bailiffs were thinking they were kind of like the sheriffs at the time. Like it was like, they just had some sort of like legal authority to punish people. And they were well, known and respected within the community. So he had a handmaid, a young handmaid. She was, I think like 17 or 18, very, very young. Her name was, was Galus Duncan. And if you guys watch Outlander, I do not, Nikki's mom does. If you watch Outlander, you will know the name and it, she is based off of the character I mean, the character is based off of the real life Galus Duncan, who was actually accused and ultimately killed for being a witch. Um, but there's like, that's the, they have the same name and that's like end of comparison. Like there's nothing else that's legit about it. So, but but it is the same name. So a lot of people, it was very hard to research. I'd be like Galus Duncan and I would get Outlander stuff and I'd be like, okay, the real story. And then be like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Here's a history site. And I'd be like, that's messed up though. Anyway, so David Seaton, he begins to notice that Galus is sneaking out at night. And he's like, where's she going? What's she doing? Uh, what's, what's going on? What's happening here, friend? And then he also starts to notice that she gets healing powers. And he's like, suspicious. So he notices that she starts to have, um, or he notices she has this innate ability to heal and he, she's got these healing powers and he's like, that's not normal. That's a sign of the devil. He accuses her and basically at the time you just had to have like a thought oh, that's a witch. And then you could accuse somebody. And that was like the extent of it. That was all the, and then, like I said, from then on, if you were accused, it's pretty much done. Like it's, there's not really a lot of coming back from that. Um, so yeah, so he accuses her and she is taken into custody and they torture her pretty, pretty severely. Um, she continues to deny and she continues to say that she's innocent. She has no association with the devil. She has no witching, uh, no uh, ties to witchcraft. She has no abilities. She has nothing. She's just a person. I'm gonna go into here part of the torture techniques. Not all of them were used on Galus. Um, Pillywinks and wrenching were both tactics that they used on Galus, but I just felt like this was kind of a natural time to talk about like some of the things that were used in terms of torture. Once again, trigger warning, horrible. These are not, these are brutal and they cause me pain just to think about. So I just want you guys to be aware before I jump into it. But so Pillywinks, this was what was also known as thumb screws torture. And basically a uh, screw like mechanism was tightened into the thumbs, which would effectively break them. I'm thinking they would go into the nail bed and they would, horrible, horrible. Um, but they would do that really slowly. And then as you know, people would continue to not confess, they would just go deeper and deeper. Wrenching was a rope was actually wrapped around the victim's head. This rope was grabbed by two different people on either side. So you wrap it around a couple of times and then the people would pull in opposite directions. And Galus from this particular form of torture suffered from skull fractures and uh, concussions. Both of those techniques were for, for certain utilized on Galus. Other techniques that possibly were used, but really weren't documented. Um, there was uh, one form of torture where they would just chain somebody to a wall and force them to stand for days on end so they couldn't sleep. And the sleep deprivation would cause them to have nervous breakdowns and to hallucinate. Um, this was an extremely effective and ineffective method a lot of times. Um, ineffective in the sense that when you started hallucinating a lot of times, people would confess to things and truly believe they might be a witch just because they've, 
not had sleep for days on end and they've been told you're a witch, you're a witch, why are you a witch? What have you, how do you know the devil and all these kind of things. So um, it was effective in getting a, a confession and, and a lot of times it was even effective in getting a confession that people truly believed, but obviously it was just out of the brains snapping and, and suddenly believing themselves that, oh yeah, yeah, no, you're right, I'm a witch, I have, sorry. Forgot to tell you. There was also branks, which were these iron muzzles, um, and they were used to hold the tongue in place so that people couldn't talk or scream during their torture. There was another thing called the breast ripper. This one really hurt, um, and it was exactly what it sounded like. It was this clamp that would go around the breast tissue, and they would twist it and then pull, and it would effectively pull off the entire bosom. So, um, truly just graphic, gruesome, horrible, horrible forms of torture. And these were not even all of them. I mean, that is just some of the more well-known ones, but they were, um, you know, they were some creative, sadistic sons of bitches, let me tell you. So all of those were methods used to force witches to confess. And once again, I come back to like, once you were accused, like this was, you weren't getting out of this unscathed. It's, it comes back to the same, you know, like the water test was a true one. They would tie your arms and legs together. They'd throw you in the river. If you floated and you were able to live, you were a witch. And if you died, then you, your gift was that you went to heaven because you hadn't made a deal with the devil. That was like, it was, it was awful. After Galus goes through her torture and she endures all of that and still refuses to confess. Finally, Seton decides he is going to do the, um, the devil's mark test where he effectively just rips off all of her clothes and checks her entire body for a mark of the devil because um, we talked about this when we did the Malleus Maleficarum uh, video. Basically, in order to, to be a witch, the devil had to leave some sort of a mark, a physical mark on your body. And oftentimes it was said because in order to um, to secure your your witch hood, your powers and every, all the effective, you know, make the deal with the devil and everything else that you were doing as a witch, um, you had to have some sort of physical act, normally intercourse with the devil and it would leave a mark. Um, so he strips her and he, um, he searches her entire body and she has a mole on her neck or her throat, kind of like right here. And that's it, that's, she's, they know. They're like, okay, well, we know you're a witch now. After that, uh, they torture her and uh, even more. And she finally breaks and um, she confesses. And as she's confessing, and this is something I know uh, some people, if they don't fully understand what was happening here, they might be like, well, why would she do this? When she confesses, she gives a list of like between 70 to 200 names of other people who were witches. And and the, the reason behind that is, well, one, who knows with the type of torture, she might've had a psychological break and she might've really believed that she was a witch and then given people's names thinking that they were also witches. Doubtful, more likely what it was, was that um, they wouldn't, you can confess and you can be like, it was me, I'm a witch, I'm the only witch, don't, you know, don't worry about anybody else, there's nobody else out there. They would just continue to torture you. They'd be like, that. we know that's not true, so give us some names. And so effectively, they just force people into accusing other people um, through the torture and, and getting them to give names is a way to make that torture stop. She gives the list of all of these other people and um, of course she has tried and uh, found guilty and executed. And the way that they would do executions at the time, um, I lied. I, in the first video when I talked about Malleus Maleficarum, I said I really didn't see a lot of circumstances where they burned witches at the stake. That was not true, I'm sorry. I, as I was doing research, I was like, wow, that was a bold ass lie. Um, my mistake, but I can own my mistake, so I'm, I'm sorry for giving you misinformation. Let me clarify, in the, the American witch trials, the uh, Salem witch trials, nobody was burned at the stake. They were all hung. Here in Scotland, we didn't really see a burning at the stake in the sense that it's shown in movies and media. It was, they would normally break the neck, hang somebody, um, or just snap their neck, and then they would burn the bodies in order to kill whatever evil was inside of them and to ensure that um, necromancers could not raise the dead body of the witch to bring them back. So that was, they were burned after they were dead, but they were normally not burned at the stake. Doesn't make it any better in my opinion but they just that's it wasn't more it was more or less like you know a precaution to like make sure that they were really gone instead of like oh this is a good form of like we want them to really suffer as they die it was a lot of i'm not def <laughs> it makes it sound like i'm trying to make it seem like well it wasn't that bad no it was that damn bad but i just it was just to be to understand it just to, just to understand what we're dealing with here so galus is gone and now they have the names of all of these other people to um 
to go in to, to hunt down. And of course, as soon as your name was given, you were arrested. That was that was probable cause right there. That was all they needed to um, to effectively arrest and uh, and ultimately find you guilty because that's what was going to happen. You were going to confess or you were going to die or you were going to confess or you're going to die in the process of trying to confess, whatever it was. So one of the names given, oh, I'm sorry. I did forget to say. This is this time period, 1590 to 1591, 92-ish, the very beginning of 92. This is effectively the um, the reign of the North Berwick witch trials. And, and Galus's death when she gives the list of names really effectively puts that into like high motion. She is definitely part of the casualties of this particular witch hunt, but she her list is what really gets people going on on the witches in this particular area. North Berwick is the, the area where all of these witches were accused uh, or found. This is the area found. So, sorry, I feel like I'm really not doing makeup. I'm just talking, but that's because I'm really passionate about this topic and I just keep getting distracted. I apologize. The next person I wanna talk about, and this is the last case I wanna talk about with this. This is Agnes Sampson. Agnes is one of the names, one of the top names given by Galus when she is, when she finally confesses. Agnes was a midwife and a healer. And when I say the word healer, I want you guys to understand, these are probably the equivalents of like doctors. Like they were mixing herbs, they were, they were creating remedies to help people with physical pain, with ailments, things like that. And unfortunately at the time, this would be like the predecessor to modern medicine or even some holistic medicines. But because of what the time period was, that kind of an ability was looked at often as like the devil's work. You couldn't win. It's like you're sick and you go to a healer and then you're gonna get in even more trouble. So also the fallout from this palette is trash. Oh my God, this whole, all my nose is like just covered in black. I'm gonna have to go fix my foundation afterwards, but that is also my own fault. So we will, we will push through and carry on. So that would be what the equivalent of like a, a healer would be. It wouldn't really be like a, it's not like they're laying hands on you and like a, like a faith healer or something like that. It's That's not really what we're looking at here. But yeah, so she was, um, she's a midwife and a healer and she was uh, arrested immediately after her name is given. She's tortured extensively. There's a good amount of time that she is in custody, but she ultimately confesses. And her confession, man, it does not help anything. It makes it a lot damn worse because she weaves this very colorful tale. When Agnes finally uh, decides to confess, when she finally comes to her breaking point, she decides to go ahead and just confess and, and deal with the fact that she is now going to be a witch and most likely going to be killed for it. She just goes into it. Like she comes up with this wild tale about all of the witches, 200 witches gathering um, like in, a, in the forest area, in like a wooded forest area on Halloween night of 1590 and they meet with the devil there. And the devil tells the, this, this, um, this coven of witches that uh, that King James is his uh, is or was the quote uh, the greatest enemy he hath in this the world. So yeah, she really just is like yeah he oh yeah he was gunning for your friend like don't even don't even think twice about that he hates your ass. So of course when King James hears this he wants to become involved with the um, interrogating. He's like now I'm. My name was dropped, oh, I gotta be in on this. So he shows up. At first, he is very skeptical about it. He's like, I don't know if I believe this or not. I feel like there's not enough proof. She could just be making it up. We have been torturing her. People say things to get out of torture. So how do we prove that what she's telling us is actually what happened? How do we, how do we find out? How do we bridge the gap between her word and, and what actually happened? What actually, was, what actually went down with the devil um, on this Halloween night? Um, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I missed I missed a whole chunk of that story. I stopped looking at my notes and just went I just went free balling it, and that was a mistake because I leave out good stuff when I do that. As well as she said that King James was the 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 greatest enemy of the devil, and then she also says that um, 
They did things like desecrate graves and mutilate corpses in order to perform rituals. Um, they cursed the sea. They threw body parts and dead animals into the sea to curse it for this particular voyage. So then after all of this, after all that information, King, King James is real, real interested in what our friend Agnes has to say. So he, um, he does become involved with her interrogation. So King James starts interrogating, and like I said, he was very skeptical at this point. Still, he he believes in witches. He just doesn't doesn't know, you know, if if a confession can be taken at face value, or you know how we can prove with like some real, so like solid proof that these witches have caused this, have done this, that the story is true. Apparently how Agnes decides to convince the king is she tells him she's able to whisper in his ear the exact conversation he had with his new bride on their wedding night, on the night they consummated their marriage. He, he, um, it's reported that she is able to say exactly word for word what he told his new bride in their uh, marital bed. And he is like, holy shit. And then, I mean, then she's done. Like she, she is, obviously tried she's tried brought up on like 112 counts i think and she's found guilty of like 53 of them and so she is executed in the same way she is um her neck is broken and then they um they burn her body which is the same way that galus was also um executed so um both of them have now um been tried and executed and it just continues from here it doesn't stop the Berwick trials end in 92. In that time, I think a hundred witches or so, maybe more, maybe a little bit less, but it was right around a hundred witches are tried and found guilty and executed for for this particular crime against the king and his new bride. Of that, honestly, I mean, that's a huge number, but they were probably not too happy with it because like I said, they had the, the number 200 was given to them by Agnes. So they were looking for all of them. They don't want any witches, no witches left behind. So um, so they probably were as many as they, you know, they were, they were effective, but they probably wanted more. And because of this, they figured they would use um, this as an example to people all over Scotland, because obviously that's just where they're at. That's just where they're located, where the king has easy access to, but that's not all the witches and he knows that. And so does everybody else who is um, who is working hard to fight the, the witch pandemic, if you will, um, that's that's taking place in Scotland in the uh, in the 16, the late, the late 1500s, the 1590s. And so he winds up, he being King James, I keep, I keep doing that where I refer to the person I'm talking about in my mind. And I think you guys are tracking, but I do try and clarify. So King James, he decides the most effective way to get the knowledge about witchcraft out to the rest of Scotland is to produce, to write and produce a pamphlet for the people to, um, to read about what happened here in the North Berwick trials. And so we actually have a really, really wonderful primary source material um, that we just don't see with a lot of things that, that come from that time because they actually documented every single person who was accused and what wound up happening to them in this little brochure um, as a way to terrify people into avoiding witches at all costs and to also inspire people to, if they feel like they um, there's a witch in their area, to inspire them to take matters into their own hands. Here's a way, here's an outline of um, how to, to deal with these witches. Here's an outline of, you know, what the trials should look like. Here's an outline of like how we got them to confess. All of this um, really very horrible, but also um, incredibly fascinating primary source documentation that we have. And this pamphlet was called News from Scotland and it circulated in 1591. And um, I mean, it was all over the, all over the country. It really just sparks this frenzy and then people everywhere all over the country are looking for witches right before King James becomes the King of England. And that's a whole story in itself. So I'm not going to even delve into it. It happens. He takes over English control and then once again, brings the trials to, um, to England as well. And we see it basically start there too. And then, um, 
and ultimately it winds up coming to Salem uh, because of one man from England. So it's just this very horrible ripple effect, effect that we see that we can trace back to Malleus Maleficarum, but we see really, really take head um, because of what's happened here with, with King James. Before, before he, he does go to England, he writes a book called Daemonology and it is written as a dialogue. I actually, I, it's dense. Mally Smell of a Karma's Dense, this is denser, it is dense. But I did read a good chunk of it. I didn't read all of it because honestly, it was important to know aspects of it, um, to see, because aspects of it were used in Salem, but I never wrote a paper, if I could go back, I would. But I never wrote a paper specifically about the Scottish witch trials. So because of that, I never read the full book, but I did use, you know, some quotes and stuff from it in my Salem trial paper because there was, I mean, there's, they're all interconnected. That's the thing about it is they are all interconnected. It's just, you know, each one has its own kind of unique circumstances, but they all relate. This da da daemonology is written as, it has a lot of similarities to Malleus Malabcarum. There's a lot of stuff about it that is very reminiscent of what we saw with Malleus Malabcarum. In it, it's written as a dialogue. I believe it's the dialogue is between like a priest and, and just a normal like citizen and the priest is trying to explain what's happening. So daemonology is broken up into three parts, similar to Malleus Maleficarum. Malleus Maleficarum was also broken up into three parts. So those three parts are, uh, the first is magic and necromancy. Then we have witchcraft and sorcery, and then we have spirits and specters. So um, basically it kind of, it not only, um, okay, this is cool. Sorry, I got distracted. I'm not really talking about the makeup, but this is like a really, I was kind of not sure what to expect from this. And it's kind of like just this really cool, like, oh yeah. Wow, I got so distracted right there. Sorry. Any who's it. So it, it really did like a job, a good job of, of well, a good job. Uh, it did a job <laughs> of um, convincing people who were basically born to only believe in God and, and believe in the devil, but not really believe that people had the power to do this kind of stuff. How can we, how can we, um, justify the existence how can we explain it and basically it boiled down to human sin and and human sin of course is such a huge part of of biblical references that it was you know they were able to um to describe uh the existence and, and justify the existence of witches through that through the ability to um the the human error and the weakness of the human and the, na the natural ability for the devil to persuade ignorant and weak humans into um to following along with him instead of following in the path of god so that is what the the book does it, it basically says you know here's how they exist here's why they can't exist and then here's what we do about them when we find out who who is corrupted by this evil Overall, uh, once 1603 hits and, and King James goes off and he um, he begins to do really the same thing in England, um, he goes in with the intention of basically uh, reforming everything. And one of the big things is he's so focused on witches and he's, you know, written demonology and, and sees himself as more or less a demon expert and a witch expert and a devil expert and all all things evil. Um, he, f he feels like he's the one who's on a crusade out to try and fix it. So um, when that happens, he goes in with the intention of, of basically reforming the English as well. And that's, we see the trials there begin. The witch trials in, in Scotland lasted until about the mid 1700s. Um, they do kind of die down around the, the 18th century, but, but still in the 1700s, we see, um, we see definitely examples of, of people uh, being killed in the name of witchcraft and um, at the end of the the journey that was the Scottish witch trials over 4,000 people were killed as witches um, not just accused but were killed as, as witches in the name of witchcraft and it truly is um, it's it's devastating it's it's sad it's such an immense number um, especially when you think about like what the population would have been back then it's 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 tons of people it's unnecessary violence and and unjustified violence and and really was just such a, a devastating and, and wild time to think about so yeah that is the scottish witch trials um and that is the look let me fix up some stuff and then i'll show you guys everything we'll close it out okay so this is the final look 
I hope you enjoyed today's video. Um, I was hoping it would be a little like more distinct, like a little less just like red and black mixed together. It didn't turn out that way. It is what it is. I really like this topic. Uh, I mean, I hate it because it's so sad, but it's, you know, you, you guys know witches is, is one of the things that I really do love to study. So I'm glad I got to share this with you guys, especially for the Dark Angel Day. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. If you have not subscribed yet, please do so. We still have four more looks to do before we reach Halloween. And I'm so excited about this. I hope you guys are enjoying the series. If you are, please give me a uh, some feedback. Um, I really want this to be a yearly thing and, and expand it further and do more and, and bigger and better every year. So yeah, if you guys are into it, then let me know. Other than that, I hope you guys are all safe, healthy. You have a wonderful day and you stay girly with a dark twist.